All right, sir. In Bob Woodward's new book, he claims that General Milley twice tried to reassure Chinese officials that he would prevent a military strike because he was, some, for some reason, concerned about you. One, was there ever any consideration of using the military? And two, what do you think about General Milley's actions? So, first of all, if it is actually true, which is hard to believe, uh, that he would have called uh, China and d done these things and uh, was willing to uh, advise them of an attack or in advance of an attack, that's treason. And I would think I've had so many calls today saying that's treason, number one. Number two, it's totally ridiculous. I never thought of it. You were there. You were you would do what was happening in the White House. You have plenty of friends. You never heard the word China mentioned in a thing like this. You heard a lot of anger about China on trade. And we made a great trade deal. You heard a lot of anger on China with the China virus. But uh, for them, for him to say, for him to say that I would even think about attacking China, I think he's trying to just get out of his incompetent withdrawal out of Afghanistan. The worst, the dumbest thing that anybody's seen, probably the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to our country, where they, they killed our soldiers. They, we left with embarrassment on our face. We left Americans behind. And we left $85 billion worth of the best equipment in the world that I bought because I was the one that rebuilt our military, and then Biden gave it away. For him to say that I was going to attack China is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, and everybody knows it. And I have to tell you, I don't know if they have him on tape saying this, but I found Woodward and I found uh, his uh, cohorts to be extremely dishonorable people. That's why I didn't do an interview with him. I think he's highly overrated. This guy is one of the most overrated guys. He's a sleaze. But I did not ever think of attacking China. One other thing, I just read a report about a week ago where they said Donald Trump was the only president in decades that didn't start a war. Hmm. Exactly. Mr. President, in response to you saying that this is treason, uh, General Milley's actions, would you have fired him if you're still president? Milley and Biden, they're incompetent people. And you know what? I spoke to numerous of the parents of those 13 soldiers that were killed. And I want to tell you, they know it better than anybody. Their, their children, those beautiful children, should be alive today because they were killed by incompetence. Yep. Well, talking about what else the Taliban has, in a Senate hearing today, Antony Blinken did confirm that the U.S. government gave the Taliban a list of Afghan nationals and U.S. officials and U.S. citizens' names, Mr. President. What should happen to the people who approved giving the Taliban this list? Well, it just shows you how incompetent. Here they are. We're talking about they've been our we've been killing them for 20 years and they've been killing us, by the way, and our people, our soldiers and people. But we've been killing them for 20 years and they hand them a list of the Americans in Afghanistan and also other people that were close that they probably didn't even know about. We gave them a list. We gave them the address. We gave them everything. Those people are in serious danger now. It is the dumbest thing. These people are the dumbest people. And Milley made it up. He made this story about me attacking China. Think of it. I'm going to attack China. Uh, what's the reason exactly, other than that they screw us on trade? You don't attack them for that. So what happens, and, and obviously COVID, uh, COVID, what they did to us on COVID is outrageous. But that I was going to attack China in a very vicious way, but he was going to inform them uh, when that will take place so they could be prepared. That is a treasonous statement, and I cannot tell you how many people called up about it. That is a disgrace. Mr. President, I want to shift gears. As you know, President Biden has sought to kick off 11 of your appointees to service academies, including my appointment that you gave me to the U.S. Naval Academy. If you ran for president again and won, excluding the statutory boards like the military service academies, would you kick off every Biden presidential appointee on day one on all of those other presidential commissions? Well, I might, because, you know, what he did is unprecedented, as you know, never happened before. And look, they're vicious people. That's all they're good at. They use prosecutors all over the place. They use local prosecutors, federal prosecutors. And yet Hunter Biden is fine, okay? They do what they're doing is horrible. They're throwing all of these people off. These are great people, including you, Sean. These are great people. 
And it's not a long term. It's a three, generally speaking, it's three year terms. And I think it's very disrespectful. For our country, it's very disrespectful. So, yeah, I guess I'd have to consider it. You know, he was going to be the great unifier, but he's not a unifier. He's the opposite. He's worse than Obama. Of course, Obama is probably running the government now anyway, according to many. Uh, Ms. President, I do want to ask you about this because it came out today that President Obama, Clinton, and Bush, they're all teaming up to raise money for Afghan refugees that are coming to the U.S. Is that something that they ask you to be a part of as well? And if not, would you support it? I support America. And I just heard that they are giving billions and billions of dollars, $10 billion to Afghanistan, on top of the 85, think of it, on top of the $85 billion worth of the best military equipment ever produced anywhere in the world, they're giving $10 billion now in aid to Afghanistan. And it's such a sad thing when you look at what's gone on over there. So they're going to give them $10 billion because it's a bribe. They want to bribe them into behaving because they've been totally disgraced by their, their withdrawal. A withdrawal like no other. Probably not only in this country, almost like in the world, because nobody's ever paid $85 billion worth of equipment when they left. There's never been a withdrawal like that. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you for that. Before I let you go, I just got to ask this. You said that you've made up your mind about whether you're running again and that your supporters will be very happy about it. When do you plan on letting us know what that decision is? Uh, I will probably not comment on that, but I will tell you, I think you will be very happy, Sean. I think you and a lot of other people that love our country are going to be very happy. I mean, I could make it soon, but, you know, that gets complicated. But uh, you are going to be extremely happy. And this country is going to come back again. We are a laughing stock all over the world. What happened in Afghanistan, what's happening at our border, where millions of people are coming in. We have no idea who they are. Uh, it's a disgrace. What's happening to our country, and now they're going to rig another election today in uh, California. You watch the results of that one. It's a disgrace what's going on with the mail-in ballots and the voting. Our country is not the same, but we're going to bring it back. Mr. President, thank you for your time. I appreciate your generosity and uh, look forward to having you back sometime soon. Thank you very much. We've been showing you this map many times, but look at it one more time. Look at the animation. It shows the timeline of the Taliban taking over Afghanistan, and it starts as recently as April. So April, May, June, July. Even a layman can see that the Taliban was rapidly closing in on Kabul. How dare Milley say he had no idea the Taliban would take Kabul so fast? He lied, and Americans died. And now, thanks to a couple of Washington Post reporters, we find out that General Milley has also done the unthinkable. General Milley was calling a general in the communist China military and said, quote, if we're going to attack, meaning the U.S., I'm going to call you ahead of time. It's not going to be a surprise for them. Basically, Milley promised he would provide the Chinese with intel if then-President Donald Trump was planning any military moves against them. The Chinese, our most dangerous global threat. That is textbook, textbook treason right there, folks. There have been people who have been executed in this country for less than what Milley has already allegedly done. An additional bombshell claim, claim came out yesterday as well. According to the reporters, Milley summoned senior officials and told them that even though it was Trump's decision alone to launch a nuclear, or if it was going to be uh, Trump's decision to launch the nuclear weapons, these people, these generals, would get Milley involved. They would have to ask Milley if that was going to be okay. Milley even went around the room and forced these officers to look him in the eye and declare their allegiance to him and his plans. Now, can you imagine the audacity of this guy to demand everyone's allegiance as he was plotting with the Chinese, the communist Chinese, to undermine a seated U.S. president? No, this man abused his power. He betrayed this country. He must be court-martialed. In hindsight, this is a man who planned the exit of Kabul that got Americans killed and has left hundreds behind, stranded in a foreign country with a new government that has proven to be ruthless, murdering terrorists. This same man is also known to be willing to collude with another one of our sworn enemies, Communist China. So some might say, perhaps, Milley, maybe he's not acting in the best interest of America. His actions suggest he may be working for a foreign government. Is that possible? Is he on the take at the expense of American lives? Was he selling information to the Chinese? 
How can we be sure he wasn't? There's one way, by military tribunal, that's how. So it's high time General Milley answers to the American people in a courtroom, not just that upcoming September 28th hearing where the Democrats, the people who put that rat in Democrat Party, will block and tackle for this traitor. After all, it's their traitor. The Biden administration has a humiliating problem on their hands. They bludgeoned the Afghanistan exit, hoping for a victory lap on 9-11. Americans died. Others were left behind. And we now know General Milley, their top military mastermind, was treasonous, incompetent, dictatorial, and all the while willing to lie about all of it. So how much more proof does Biden need before he, the commander in chief, calls for Milley's court martial? Well, a press release sent out just this afternoon from Milley's office itself now confirms everything we talked about, everything we heard, everything I just told you. Here's their statement. They say, quote, Milley's calls with the Chinese and others in October and January were in keeping with these duties and responsibilities, conveying reassurance in order to maintain strategic stability. Now, here, here for reaction to General Mark Milley's obviously treasonous actions, in my opinion, retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. General, thank you for being here. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you for our freedom. So you see this, you watch this. General to General, what do you say to Mark Milley? Yeah, so first of all, uh, Eric, thanks for having me on and to your audience. This is really an incredible uh, time for us to be looking at what is happening in this country, what is happening to our country. Uh, these, these, uh, it, this information about Mark Milley, who I know very well, uh, it really, really is, is, is so devastating. And so let's take a step back, if, if you don't mind, from the from the, the calls for treason and the calls for court-martial, the very first thing, that, that statement that you just showed, Eric, that's the first time that I've seen that statement today because I've just been so damn busy. But I, I will tell you, that tells me that Millie, in fact, made these statements that uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, acquitted to him in, in Woodward's book. So this is really, really an important uh, uh, thing that but what Millie needs to do we don't need investigations. So, so General, 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 this is a very, very important point, because this just broke you know, just prior to the yeah. show. It's an important yeah. point. So we were all waiting. We heard about the accusations from the Woodward and Costa book, and we were waiting to see how Millie would respond. Would he say, no way, that didn't happen? That would force Woodward and Costa to put up or shut up, maybe even have to talk about sources. But he didn't. Millie didn't. He basically admitted that he made those calls in October and January. Now, what were the calls about and what, what, what was said? is still up for speculation, which my point is, making those calls when a seated U.S. president, to, to literally telling the Chinese government, don't worry, I will subvert my own president and work with you to make sure you're okay. How is that not treason, sir? Yeah, it, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's illegal, it's immoral, and it's unethical. And Mark Milley should, should be immediately, immediately uh, told to drop his stars and and uh, he should be resigning in disgrace, if not completely fired and publicly. The one institution that we cannot lose hope in and faith in, which because every other institution of government, Eric, the, the American people have lost faith in. The one institution that still remains is our uniformed military. And Mark Milley, you know, Mark Milley is doing such incredible. I mean, he's actually doing grave, grave, which is the strongest word I can use, grave damage. To the institute of the military by continuing to stay in the uh, in the office of chairman of the joint chiefs and that is a that is a place that i worked i worked for a chairman i know what intelligence he had you showed those those maps at the beginning trust me for him to stand up there and say that they didn't know that's a that's an excuse you don't make excuses at this level of our armed forces there's no excuse so so sir so, so, Mark, so sir Pardon me, I don't mean to interrupt the general, uh, but, but general, so, so they made this decision. They made a plan, whether it's the State Department or the Pentagon or the White House, whatever, they're all together. Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, had all the intel at his fingertips. They make a plan that ultimately failed, and we lost 13 of our beautiful service members because of their plan. But Milley, right after that, is, and we played that soundbite, said, there's no way, and he made the, boy, the, big, the big boy voice in the, in the face. He said, there's no way I had any intel that would tell me that this was happening. I'm not a military person, and I thank God we have military people, but I will tell you, watching that map from April will tell you that they, the Taliban was closing in 
on the most populous and most important city in Afghanistan, which was Kabul. How could this man look the American people in the eye and say that other than to, defer, to, to divert attention to the fact that they failed and Americans died? Yeah, he's, Mark Milley, to make that statement, is full of it. Uh, we retreated. We retreated from Afghanistan. We surrendered to the Taliban, and we retreated under fire, and we left American citizens behind enemy lines. There's no other way to say it. I mean, this is such a humiliation and a shaming of America. And for Mark Milley, I, I mean, I, I actually, when it all happened, it was so heartbreaking for me, especially for the 13 uh, military who lost their lives or gave the, you know, the last true measure of devotion to our freedom. Uh, it, 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 I was actually more upset with the military, and particularly Mark Milley, for the decisions that were, they were made, because this is Tactics 101. We're not that incompetent in the military. There's, there's a level of complicity here by Mark Milley. And now, with some of these statements that are coming out of Woodward's book and this latest statement that just came out of the chairman's office, this is not good. This is not good for the General, country. General. So Mark Milley, go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. Joe, Joe one more question. I, I, I'm a little crunched for time here, but I have a very yep. important question to ask you, sir, specifically. If this were Trump and you were working with Trump and something like this happened, what would the media do? What would the left-wing media do to you and President Trump if they found out that there was a phone call made to the Chinese behind the president's back or, 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 or behind Biden's back, for that matter? I'm surprised that they're not blaming Trump for all of this right now, Eric. It's so bad. You know, I mean, the American people know, your audience knows. This is so damaging to the national security of the United States of America. This is so damaging to the Institute of the Military uh, for this country. Mark Milley needs to resign now, before the end of this day is over, Mark Milley needs to step down. And if this administration continues to keep him on in this leadership role, it, 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 is, it, it just shows you the direction that the country is taking. So uh, I appreciate you having me on, but, but Mark Milley needs to resign. This is, this is disgraceful. And then, and then once he's out of that position, then we can decide, the American people and, the, and our government can decide what to do about Mark Milley, whether to bring him up on charges and yeah. such. But this, this is terrible, and uh, and it, this is it's unsettling, and uh, and there's an element of treason in it. I, I don't want to go that far, but I would just tell you that that there's no way in the world that Mark Milley should be in this office in this job any longer than by midnight tonight. He should be gone. Jennifer. John, there are two allegations in the new Woodward Costa book that um, have to do with this building in particular, whether General Milley inserted himself into the uh, nuclear launch process. Is there anything unusual that you've seen or that is the defense secretary concerned about the reports that General Milley um, uh, inserted himself into the, tried to stop the president at the time from having the ability to launch nuclear weapons. Can you explain how the process works? And it's been explained to us that he went and just went through, reviewed the procedures, and that he told them that they he should be on any conference call uh, with the president, that that's part of the procedures. Is that part of the nuclear procedures? I'm confused. Well, I certainly can't speak to uh, the revelations that are coming out uh, in the book. Um, I think you saw. Uh, a statement by the the chairman's office uh, specifically addressing this issue. Um, what I can tell you is that it is not uncommon at all for the department to continue to review security protocols, particularly when it comes to our strategic deterrence capabilities, that we constantly take a look at the protocols and the procedures to make sure that they are still relevant. And these Protocols have been, play, been in place for a long time, a couple of decades, and so it's, it's not uncommon. It's also completely appropriate, and again, I'm not speaking to the validity of things that are in the book, but it is completely appropriate for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as the senior military advisor to both the secretary and the president, uh, to want to see those protocols reviewed uh, on whatever frequent basis that, that he wants to, to do that. So. Um, Again, I can't speak to the validity, but I see nothing in what I've read that would, uh, that would cause any concern. What is the chairman's role in terms of the nuclear launch, if there were a nuclear launch by the president? Well, the, the chairman is uh, the key na uh, military advisor to the, pr to the president, to the commander-in-chief. Um, and 
in a sequence of events whereby a commander in chief uh, would be making that decision, that most grave of decisions, the chairman would be intimately involved in that process in providing advice and counsel to both the secretary and to the president. Obviously, the president in this case makes the final decision. Um, uh, and, you know, by statute, by law, he is the prime military advisor to the president. And this would be a military decision of profound proportions here and importance. So he would be absolutely involved in that process, soup to nuts. And was there anything unusual said to the Chinese counterpart in the phone calls as far as you understand? Well, again, I, all, I, all I've seen is the same reporting that you've seen, Jen. I, I, I can't speak to the, um, the specifics of the conversation, a conversation that took place obviously before, uh, uh, before this administration uh, uh, took office. Um, but I would add, if I may, again, that it is not only uh, common, it's expected that a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, would continue to have counterpart conversations. I mean, he is basically the chief of defense for the United States. We don't call him that. But he has chief of defense counterparts around the world. Um, and having worked for a chairman myself for quite a bit, I can tell you uh, frequent communication with two countries like Russia and China is not atypical at all for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, and those communications are uh, they're routine, they're staffed, they're coordinated, um, uh, and they're transparent, uh, as, as transparent as they can be. Would it also be routine uh, in these, these counterpart conversations if the United States was planning to strike one of these locations for the chairman to inform his counterpart that the U.S. was about to strike, as is quoted in the world? Yeah, again, I'm not going to get into the uh, con con confirming or speaking to details in, in question, reporting. Would, it, would, it be a would that be a common part of these conversations is if the United mm -hmm. States was planning to conduct a strike on a location, right. would the chairman then call his counterpart to alert them to an in incoming strike? Without speaking to that hypothetical, what I, what I again would say is that these par parts of the value, a part of the value of having these communications, particularly with countries like uh, Russia and China, with which we are experiencing tension, is to try to reduce the risks of miscalculation and conflict, to try to take down tensions, to, uh, to make clear uh, what our national security interests are on you pick the issue. And that's, that's a, the, the, the communication channel between our chairman and a chief of defense is a really key vehicle for transmitting and communicating those kinds of messages. And then has Secretary Austin, based off of these the stories out of this book, has he uh, instructed General Milley to ch change any of the ways that he's operating? Has he asked him to inform him more about some of the conversations that he's having? Has, has there been any practical change on this current Absolutely Pentagon leadership? Not. No, not in the least. Has full trust and confidence in Chairman Milley and the job that he's doing. Laura. Hey, thanks, John. Um, so just following up uh, on the previous questions, um, as you said, by law, by statute, the chairman mm -hmm. is not in the chain of command. So if these allegations are true, that General Milley gave, said that he would give a heads up to the Chinese if we were going to strike them, would, not, would that not be undermining civilian control of the military? Uh, again, I'm not going to speak to uh, unconfirmed reports from uh, a book that we haven't looked at and read yet, um, and certainly not to a conversation that, uh, that that took place before the administration took office. I'm just, I'm not going to go there, Laura. I guess I can't really understand why you're not denying that that is happening, that that happens, since that's a pretty serious allegation. I'm, I'm not speaking to it at all, Laura. It's not that I'm not denying it. I'm simply, I'm, I'm going to refuse to speak uh, to, uh, to specific anecdotes uh, uh, that that are in this book. I, I'm in no position to do that. I, and, I, and I don't think it would be helpful for me to, to try to speculate one way or the other about the veracity of these, of these anecdotes. What I can tell you is that uh, a chairman of the, any chairman, a chairman, chairman uh, across multiple administrations routinely have uh, communications, direct channel communications with their counterparts in, in uh, other countries. And it is particularly important to have those communications uh, with a nation state uh, with which there are 
real and significant tensions to try to reduce those, clear things up, make sure you reduce the risk of miscalculation. Uh, and, and I think you saw in the, uh, the statement that the chairman's office that they put out earlier today that that's exactly what the, was behind the context here for this, for this particular call, which, which took place at a, you know, uh, at a difficult time in, in our nation's history uh, in this particular transition. And sorry, just to follow up on that point, Secretary, Secretary Miller, acting Secretary Miller, told Fox News that he did not authorize the call. And another one of his, his deputy chief of staff also said that, in fact, it was the policy at the time that there was no senior government engagement with China. Is that true? But could that possibly be true? I, 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 couldn't, I, I couldn't answer that. I mean, that, 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 that those were... Uh, th those were before. That was time before we we uh, were in office. I, I can't I can't speak to what the policies were for um, international communications were. Uh, but again, you saw it in the chairman's statement uh, why why he was having these conversations, and you also saw in his statement that those communications were staffed and, and coordinated. I would point you back to what the the, the chairman said. Yeah. Thank you, John. So. He said it's, it's routine for the chairman to, to speak to uh, counterparts in China and, and Russia. And, and in this context, the, the statement talked about strategic stability. So it's, it includes uh, issues related to uh, nuclear capabilities. And you said you worked for, for a chairman. Um, can you help us understand, usually when these type of conversations at this level happen, uh, does the chairman brief the president or get the uh, green light from the president before such a conversation? Does he brief the president on the conversation? And does he get the green light from the uh, secretary of defense or brief him after the conversation? Yeah, it depends. I know that's not a great answer, but it's a true answer. I mean, we expect uh, a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to coordinate and communicate with his counterparts. and. Some of those uh, conversations are about very specific issues that have very, very high level interest. And, uh, and th it, th there might even be a request made by the chairman to make a call. Uh, sometimes the secretary could ask him to do that, or e even uh, representatives on the National Security Council could say, hey, wouldn't it, you know, we think it would be helpful if you reached out to your counterpart uh, and relayed the, the following message. Sometimes the, the, the chairman will, you know, uh, will 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 he be the one that come up with the idea like hey I think I need to get on the phone uh, with General or Admiral so and so and and have a talk about this, um, but typically regardless of the impetus for that kind of a call it is read out it is it is staffed it's 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 appropriately coordinated uh, and the 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 chairman or the chairman's office will will offer a, a readout of it uh, up the chain of command so that everybody understands it. And then oftentimes, and you've seen this yourself, I mean, the chairman's public affairs office will release a public readout, not unlike the ones we do when, when the secretary makes calls. I mean, the, you know, these are important communications. I mean, um, they don't just pick up the phone to talk about sports. I, it, they, 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 they talk to, to iron out issues. And, um, and so it's important that the interagency have a sense of of how that went, and that's and that's very typical. So, so the, the chairman usually coordinates with the White House prior to the conversation, especially if it's about certain topics. In a, in a, in a typical call, particularly with um, uh, you know a, a nation like China, that would be a fully coordinated conversation, and there would be there would be uh, the sharing of information um, after the fact. So the White House, basically, and President Trump back then. Uh, former President Trump would actually know about the conversation before taking place and would know what happened in the conversation. So for him to say if the allegations made in the book uh, by Woodward and, and Costa were, were true, then the chairman should be put on trial for, for treason. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, these are not my words. These are what, yeah, what look, I, I can't speak to processes before this administration took office. I just can't. I, 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 as much as I know you'd like me to, I, I just can't do that. What I'm telling you is typically um, that uh, when the chairman or the secretary, uh, they interact with their counterparts, it, it's a function of the job. They have to do that, uh, that, the, that, that these conversations are, 
are properly coordinated. That's, that's the way it goes. Now, is every single interaction you know, written down and sent in a memo? Probably not, but, uh, but ones that, that, are, you know, that, that are of consequence, uh, and they almost all are, that they are, they are fully coordinated. I can't speak to processes you know, previous to January 20th of this year. I can just tell you that how, how we're approaching the issue in this administration. Thank you. Let me get to the phones. I haven't done that yet. Jeff Shogel. Uh, thank you. The, I know the Biden administration aspires to be as transparent as possible. In that spirit, would it be possible to get a transcript of General Milley's October 30th conversation with his Chinese counterpart, uh, especially noting that uh, the previous administration released a transcript of President Trump's conversation with President Zelensky? So I'm hoping that this administration can be just as transparent. Uh, Jeff, I, I, I'm certainly not going to uh, sign us up to releasing uh, transcripts of, of conversations that occurred before we took office, uh, and I, uh, uh, I just I, I can't do that. I'd refer you to the chairman's office if uh, if you want uh, more context on that, but uh, we're, we're not in a position to do that. Let me get back on the phones here. Uh, Idris, Reuters. Hey, John, moving uh, away from Australia and just following up on Courtney's question. Um, does the secretary believe the chairman has the authority to warn adversaries before a military attack without specifically being told by civilian leaders? Again, I'm not going to engage in specific hypotheticals here, Idris. I, I just don't see this as a, a useful exercise. And uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a bit of a roundabout way of, of of trying to get me to speak to uh, again an unconfirmed report in a book, and I, I just I'm just not able to to do that. What the secretary expects, and what he has seen from Chairman Milley in the eight months that he's been in office, is that the chairman will maintain healthy relationships to the degree that he can with his counterparts around the world, and that. Uh, and that those relationships will be in keeping with our policies, the policies of this administration. Uh, and he expects that the, the chairman knows how to manage those relationships and to have those communications and that he'll be transparent about it with the secretary, and he has been. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, John. Uh, if the chairman is willing to go around one president he disagrees with, is there a concern in this administration that he might repeat it if he ever has an issue? Uh, with with President Biden, I mean, so, so what I'm asking is, is there a trust? What's the trust factor specifically with the chairman and the secretary, since they have such a close relationship by statute, as well as with the president and a long history together? The the secretary has complete and utter trust and confidence in General Milley uh, and in his role as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yes. Okay, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. We'll see you in a day or two. China looking to expand its influence in the region. Beijing claims Taiwan as a territory, prompting the island nation to conduct military drills designed to replicate a potential offensive. Western powers are keeping an eye on the conflict, as Taiwan's foreign minister is warning that the country is the last line of defense against the CCP's takeover of key shipping routes in the South China Sea. A democratic Taiwan serves as a sea fortress to block China's expansionism into the white Pacific. But China isn't only trying to expand into the Pacific, as it continues to work with Pakistan and the new leadership in Afghanistan to advance its infrastructure projects across the Middle East. But Western powers fear China won't always be exerting soft power and wants to make sure they're negotiating from a position of strength in hopes they never have to use the equipment that they're investing in. In all of these conflicts, there's a similar theme, that being Chinese involvement. The country's encroachment was a major topic at the G7 and NATO summits back at the beginning of the summer, and it's expected to be another major conversation when G20 leaders meet here in Rome next month.